Welcome to the Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Acheson. Today's guest is Mr. Bruce Campbell, former executive director of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, currently at Ottawa University, I believe, for the Centre of I'm actually, Human Rights. I'm actually um, uh, an adjunct professor uh, at York University in the Faculty of Environment Studies, okay. and I, I have a senior fellow at Ryerson in the Center for Free Expression. Great. Uh, so that page I found on Google was out of date. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> Must have been. I thought I was being good by doing my homework. <laughs> but I spent a year at the at the law faculty at the University of Ottawa. Okay. I had a fellowship based on the work I did on Lac Megantic. Um, I I got this Ontario Law Foundation. Uh, award, and that allowed me to be uh, to have this fellowship uh, at the law faculty at the University of Ottawa in the year of 2016. Great. And as we were warming up before the show, um, can we start with playing with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives? Sure. Because yeah. over time, it has become part of our narrative. And for general public, um, you will see them surface around budget time. Because uh, it's now part of how media pick up the story. That's right. Because I believe it was CCPA that did the uh, a CEO at a company makes in the first 15 minutes what somebody makes in the rest of the year. Yeah. Um, that comparative understanding of a yeah. complex equation. Can you walk us through some of those stories? Because it's it's really come to play today. Yeah. Well, the the uh, the the they're both related. They're separate stories, uh, and and the the CEO pay story. Of top hundred CEOs compared to the median worker, uh, and it's it and it's and it's done uh, every year, and they research uh, going through all the documents. It's quite an elaborate process <laughs> to get the 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 CEO pay um, and all its components, right? Like even trying uh, to access that. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> and so the CCPA developed, and the people the. The people doing it developed the techniques over the years, and so then they compare it with the, the medium worker. And it, basically, what they find is that the the CEO makes uh, in uh, the first couple of hours of the new year after coffee break in the in in the morning what the median income worker takes a year. Uh, to uh, to earn so that was and that was in that's integrated then in the alternative budgets that we do because a lot of the uh, the proposals the revenue proposals which are designed to address and reduce inequality which you know which is you know a huge problem uh, and, and not just in Canada south of the border it's even even worse um, and so um, and so those kind of the the that CEO pay gets kind of provides the initial framework and the introduction then to the the alternative budget which when I was there usually came out a couple of weeks before the government's budget yeah. and we would meet uh, in the days when Paul Martin was uh, was finance minister and the famous Martin budget of 1995 was the first year we did an alternative budget and although we disagreed what Martin was doing unlike any of his successors, Martin loved to discuss policy. So he would invite us in before we released and we would kind of give him a, an idea of what we were doing and we'd have a conversation and he would say, well, this is very good because he gets a lot of people that come in and say we want this or want that. And yeah. we actually put it in a, in a, in a fiscal Context. framework. Yeah. And uh, you know, and, and the numbers add up, and we get into uh, independent ver verification, and and <coughs> and so you know, so the fact that we would d do this, and then it would become a, known to the media that we did it, was a was something that it gave it attracted the media to what we were saying, and gave it a kind of legitimacy, mm. uh, you know, right from the beginning. And then we'd forecast budget surpluses. Uh, and we'd be much more at, a, accurate than uh, the Department of Finance. So all of that kind of happened uh, beginning in the mid-90s, and it still continues. They still do the alternative budget, even though I've, I've left the organization yeah. four years ago. Yes, because it made its way into the Canadian consciousness. Yeah. And it's also um, providing another perspective or a solution. Mm -hmm. um, there are some who feel that something needs to change, whether it's our relationship with our climate or our environment, or how we do business, um, which the Lac Megantic story we'll get into in a bit because that's an example of how to do business maybe the wrong way. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do we hold together as a country? So here your organization is creating this other way of getting to a certain endpoint, but it's got a whole different consequence to it for the country mm -hmm. as opposed to the corporate mindset. Here's, a, here's yeah. another way. There aren't many organizations that provide the solution or offer a solution. Yeah. Usually it's don't do this and don't do that. That's right. So now it's, you know, 30 some odd years later, close to, um, is it making any headway yet? Because you, you kind of have to wait for your audience to yeah. find you a little bit yeah, yeah. before they go, you know, we could have been doing it this way since 1999 or yeah. 2000. Yeah. And we would have seen the fruits of that on a 20 year yeah. cycle. Well, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, as the problem worsens, the problem of inequality uh, worsens, uh, and the problem of un and underemployment and minimum wage uh, inadequately paid uh, uh, work where people are, are, are having, having to work a multitude of jobs to survive. I, I mean, I think of all of those things, the problems have heightened. I think over the years, one can see examples where various governments have taken elements, um, uh, not em not embracing it its entirety as a, as a strategy as an approach, but taking elements, uh, tax elements, uh, uh, and including them in their platforms. In in some cases, uh, you know, and I, I don't I don't recall the conservatives doing it. Maybe they did uh, here and there, but uh, certainly the liberals took pieces here and there, and the NDP platforms and the Green platforms also. Um, and we would, uh, one of the things that we did before uh, budget time was an analyze, I'm not sure if they're still doing it, we'd, we'd uh, analyze the various uh, party platforms and how they, you know, accorded with or didn't accord with or places they accorded with uh, the alternative budget. Yeah. One of New Brunswick's challenges ongoing is um, how we have our narrative around our debt and deficit. Mm -hmm. So it won't matter which party's in power. Mm -hmm. um, that narrative is carried since the mid 80s. Yeah. What's fascinating is that we don't change our approach mm -hmm. <laughs> over all that time. We're still approaching it more or less the same way. Government cuts mm -hmm. and uh, not much talk of new revenue streams for government. It tends to get to government cuts it, it, because the new new revenue streams might invite a whole other way of looking at how to build a community or a province and an economy. Yeah, I'm away yeah. from the industrial based model into this other kind of model. Yeah, and what would suit New Brunswick? Buried in that conversation is slowly emerging the notion of a bank in New Brunswick, because mm. once upon a time Canada mm -hmm. used to have the Bank of Canada, uh, as best I understand it, and we weren't in debt. And mm -hmm. we were able to recover after World War II and build a lot of infrastructure. Yeah. But then the 70s came along and a different ideology came along. And they changed the rules that it operated under. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that begs the question, is there, in your view, uh, an opportunity, given that you're policy alternatives? <laughs> yeah. You know, it, in that old world, because you've got a, a lot of history with working yeah. in that space. Yeah. Do you ever... Can you see a way that a small province like New Brunswick might be able to create its own bank um, and then mm. have its own method for getting out of debt, yeah. which is the very narrative we've been yeah. working on for 40 years. Yeah. And we don't see it yet that the way we're approaching the problem is the problem. Yeah. We need to yeah. go back to something we used to do once upon yeah. a time. Yeah. That sounds like a policy that's, alternative. That, in yeah, a that's, a, that's a question. I mean... Monetary policy is, uh, you know, is a federal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, there are, um, I believe Alberta had a, um, a bank at one point, um, and I, I, it was probably restricted in in how it could uh, issue credit. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's been, what's happened, I think, is when they privatize the creation of credit to the extent that they have, they've given free reign uh, to private banks to, you know, basically uh, um, create credit at will. There are some restrictions, but, you know, we, we and, and the banks are fairly like it's not a Free for all, as much as well, it was highly oligopolized in the U.S. too. Uh, but they really went overboard in terms of lending to, um, you know, subprime lending with very little deposits uh, yep. as as uh, as a counter to that or as insurance against uh, massive default. And I think if you uh, 
And, and, you know, I think there's, I mean, I don't follow the banking industry closely, but I know there are people that are actually concerned about the private bank's exposure hmm. uh, right now in the and some fragility in the event of the market market turning. I know that one of the people that was involved in predicting uh, the big short, I don't know if you saw the documentary, the big short, yep. is, uh, is you can, you can, uh, Check him out. Uh, he's he's uh, he has his. Uh, I was just reading this the other day. He has his concerns about the viability of the banking system and its ability to to survive going uh, crisis going forward. So, yeah. in, in in any case, I mean, we're talking about the free reign or a lot of flexibility for the banks to to create credit, and a lot of that was taken away from. Yeah. Uh, from the central bank, and the central bank had a role before in interacting with the provinces and it being able to lend to the provinces. Mm. Um, you know whether whether um, uh, a province could uh, could create. A, you know, I think it's I think it's viable. I can't uh, tell you as as uh, as someone authoritative, but yes. it's definitely an I idea uh, exploring. One of the things that we um, well one one of the things that we um, uh, have looked at, or one of my colleagues has written papers on, is postal banking. So having the post office uh, uh, kind of fill in where, especially in small rural communities where, you know, all you've got, if that is a bank machine, right, where the banks are withdrawing and and also would have a, um, a lending function, a credit creating function that would not be governed by the same imperatives that the that the big banks are. So mm -hmm. I think there are all kinds of options mm -hmm. for the public sector uh, or public corporations uh, and 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 possibly provincial as well as federal, mm -hmm. or uh, corporations like uh, uh, Canada Post to to get into that that situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we can tie um, the privatization of the banking system with the growing inequity mm -hmm. in, in society, which means there needs to be a systemic shift somewhere. Absolutely. Um, not only in service delivery, but also in ideology. Yeah. It has to somehow yeah. become part of our storytelling yeah. that I, this I is agree. a good thing to do. Yeah. And, and I, you know, in my work on like Megantic, um, my story starts with uh, Mulroney. Because mm -hmm. uh, Mulroney came into power... Um, Kind of on the on the crest of the neoliberal wave with with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and then the uh, you know the um, the Godfather being Milton Friedman yep. and then you had the think tanks well you had the Business Council on National Issues which was created uh, around that time in the late seventies I believe the hundred and fifty largest corporations since changed its name but it's the same hundred and fifty or it's the hundred and fifty corporations and they basically provided the policy it was the policy shop from Mulroney because uh, Mulroney wasn't a big policy wonk, but you know he was uh, he was a clever politician, uh, and you know that began. And there was also the Fraser Institute that was created around that time, the C.D. Howe longer, but it kind of shifted its its uh, its orientation. So that was what was kind of driving all of this. And so when Mul Mulroney came to power in in '84, and and uh, you know really got uh, got the wave. Um, underway in many sectors, began broke up the National Energy Program, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, and Petro Canada, and started the free trade negotiation and all of that. And uh, I mean, I, I didn't start off being a, a student of railway sector uh, uh, economics and policy, but the, the forces of deregulation. And in the railway sector, ultimately the privatization of CN, and kind of combined with um, austerity, um, th they were all kind of interacting and reinforcing this this uh, uh, this deregulation of uh, of of the rail sector to the point where they were they were basically regulating themselves, uh, and, uh, and and then it went from there. Uh, we're getting into the the, the main no. to topic, but that was my basis for for investigating this was my knowledge of the broader policy rather than the specifics of the railroad sector. But that's a very important theme to pick up on because this didn't happen in thin air, you know. So Lac Megantic's tragedy has a long history, 
that got it to that point in time. Mm -hmm. um, there are several of those sorts of stories nowadays. Watch the news any day and you'll see a disaster of some sort somewhere. Yes. And when you wait two or three days and if someone has latitude to actually do some investigative reporting, yeah. then you'll learn that there was a cutback on safety, there was a cutback on staffing, or there was a need for a certain profit margin in a fiscal quarter. Yeah. Um, all those are kind of different values at play and one value tends to dominate that <laughs> narrative. Mm -hmm. And trying to expose that to the public so they could be part of the conversation is a real challenge. Yeah. And Mike Megantic is a, a classic example of that. As you did your work on that book, you must have found um, obstacles all along the way to find... Finding information? Yes. Uh, yeah. You know? Yeah. It, it's because it gets buried or yeah. um, we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to talk about meanwhile, it. Meanwhile, yeah. meanwhile there's a huge consequence uh, mm -hmm. economically, spiritually, mm -hmm. um, politically. Yeah. And, and it's like that circle hasn't closed yet. It yeah. still stays open and it's still messy. Yeah. Does, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, you it's, know? it, it does. And it's, it's interesting. You talk about uh, other sectors and um, recently the, the, the two Boeing crashes in Indonesia and Ethiopia have, um, you know, have been in the news, and there's been a certain amount of reporting that has exposed uh, the safety gaps and the uh, the the relationship between the regular regulator and the regulated industry. And I central to my work is the theme of regulatory capture. Uh, and so I've been I've been asked to to comment on Boeing. Uh, it's sort of the, it's, 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 it's the consequence of having written this book, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that when, when something like this happens, I'm in people's Rolodexes because I've already, uh, analyzed, uh, uh, the causes and consequences of, of, a, of, of deregulation that have, that have, uh, led to, a, a, a disaster like this. It's not, uh, it, it, it's 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 uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book, uh, uh, one of many reasons. But I wanted to. There is that tendency, and it happened here in 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 Lac Megantic. Uh, you know, this. Uh, of course, when it happens, this is the huge focus of attention and reporting yeah. and the crush of reporters. But as time goes and and the cameras go away and memories start to fade and then the government says we've taken all necessary safety measures to make sure it doesn't happen again and then people forget the causes and the causes uh, uh, being you know regulatory failure uh, negligence corporate negligence uh, corporate capture those are kind of underlying causes they get forgotten and then it and then they kind of seep back in and then it happens again, and that's kind of, you know, at least I've, I've, uh, it's, it's, a, it's got a broad scope. I cover it from you know, its beginnings, uh, the beginnings in '95 of the changes to the, to the railway sa uh, safety leg uh, legislation and rules and regulations, and how over time they eroded uh, safety protections. Uh, to the point uh, where, you know, they just set the stage for the dis disaster. It was no longer a, qu a question of if, it was a question of when and where. And, you know, then in that year before, I document kind of the events which kind of uh, made it that uh, a situation of Russian roulette. Yeah. The, um, and it's railroad. So in a way, railroad is a bit like food or air or water because it connects so many diverse things. Yeah. So many people might not be aware, but it would be buried somewhere in that bigger context that Canada had a bumper crop of wheat two or three years ago or five, six years mm -hmm. ago. And they couldn't get it to mm -hmm. port because oil was more profitable for the railway. And Hunter Harrison's value system, mm -hmm. as he was speaking to his shareholders uh, for that quarterly div dividend or the yearly dividend. Yeah. Do you think we can ever close the loop that it actually goes back to the shareholders? Um, Hunter Harrison, in a way, was doing his job as the CEO of the rail line. Which one? CN or CP? Yeah, well, he kind of carried that value system to both. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> to both, right? Yes, he did. And and, and uh, so what I was wanted to play, there's two things that came to mind when prepping for this. One was, can we close the loop so that it's the shareholders 
that start to be the ones held accountable yeah. for putting pressure on the CEO. Yeah. So if you're a shareholder in CN or CP, somehow you're connected yeah. to Lac Megantic's disaster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that pattern can also yeah. then apply to a lot of other places yeah. that you've done. And then the other thing that hovers for me is, has, and it's a blunt question, and yeah. it might be unfair, but yeah. has lying become the standard practice for business at a certain level? Is it like pre-built that now you have to lie in order to survive? I'm thinking of SNC Lavalin and all yeah. the shenanigans there, yeah. and if we'll learn, yeah, and, and then how media reports it. Yeah. Uh, the lack Megantic, Megantic is a classic example of a value set that doesn't fit with yeah. accountability to yeah. your community. Yeah, and you're covering it up, and yeah. you, and, you know, and yeah. New Brunswick struggles with its own version because yeah. we have, you know, the Irvings have a huge impact on the province. Yeah, um, it'll be tend to be viewed as very negative by some, yeah. and by others as very positive and we're yeah. stuck in that space yeah but it's clear we can't get at a version of a shared truth yeah yeah i mean it's you know and that's uh, uh and one of the things that got me started um on on this work uh was you know i watched it like thousands of others millions of others on tv and i couldn't believe what was happening uh, and I was on vacation at the time, so I had more time to, was in the gas bay with my wife. So I had more time to kind of l go online, look on at, at the TV and, 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 and just watch how it was unfolding. And so in, none of the major players were taking any blame. And they were all blaming ultimately the last link in the chain, which is the locomotive engineer, I said, this is not right. You know, they're accountable and they're hiding their accountability, uh, whether straight lying or just protecting the, for the legality of, of, of you know, not, not uh, um, you know, not admitting any kind of responsibility, but they didn't. And neither Hunter Harrison uh, nor Ed Burkhardt nor Stephen Harper it was all, you know, they didn't follow the rules. They did, we set the rules, they didn't follow the rules. And that, you know, so for sure that, that is happening. But going back to Hunter Harrison, because he's a big player in this. And even though he de he's dead, he, he continues to have huge influence on the railways. Um, obviously, when CN was a crown corporation, it wasn't, it didn't, it wasn't um, vulnerable to that kind of short-termism of raising shareholder value, but it certainly came into play shortly after. And with Hunter Harrison at the helm, I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with his his philosophy or or his mode of operation is probably a better word. Philosophy is too grand a term, perhaps, but it's it is basically you know he was a real hardliner. He was, came from Memphis, and he was gonna you know. I think at one point he said, um, you know, he moved in there like General, what's the, the Confederate? No, it was no. Uh, during the Civil War, okay. um, uh, moved into Atlanta. Um, uh, the name will come to me. But anyways, I mean, he, what basically his philosophy is to run fewer trains, longer trains uh, with fewer people and have the those who were remaining work longer hours. I mean, it created uh, a real shift in the corporate labor culture. Uh, and it also created ma major concern in other uh, forms of transportation, right? Or other products, whether it's forest products or grain. And, you know, at one point they had a, they, they had a commission of inquiry inquiring into what CN had, w was doing. Uh, in any case, so he just shook things up. General, no, I still don't have his name. Um, I was going to say Patton, but um, <laughs> but it's not Patton. Um, but anyway, so he retired uh, in 2009 mm -hmm. uh, with all the, the consequences of that, you know, that period after privatization. Um, and then um, there were people in the Wall Street hedge fund business that were looking at various railroads and looking for uh, shareholder opportunities. Um, and a guy named Bill Ackman with Pershing Square in New York uh, had a look at CP and saw, boy, those its operating ratio is very high. Uh, its shares are undervalued. There's, there's potential here. So he started buying shares. And, and he also had his eye on who he was going to bring in to run the show, and that was Harrison. And so he got 
you know, as an activist investor with 15% of the shares, he gained control of the company. Uh, and there were some big investment funds that kind of went along with it. They're not railroad people, but he fired the CEO and he fired the whole board and he replaced it with his people, with, with Harrison Ford at, at the helm. So now Harrison Ford has precision railroading, railroading to implement, which he did. And the kind of the same kind of pattern unfolded. But Harrison had also, CP had a lot of track in, in the back and formation, more than any other railway except BNSF. BNSF, uh, well, I'll just finish the story because what he... He, he did his thing, Ackman did his thing at CP, and they both left in 2016, and they both made a bundle. And Harrison Ford, once again, left and went to CSX, which, was a, which is another big class one railway that runs right down the East Coast. He did the same thing, uh, and he set in motion all of, the, all of the structures, and he hired the people because he knew he was dying. Uh, and then he died. And then it's been followed. That format has been followed. And the one sort of uh, strong opposition to that is BNSF. And guess who owns all of the BNSF? Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett has really decried the use of that approach. It's a short-term, it's, it's, it's an approach for short-term gain and long-term pain. And it's also uh, has huge... Uh, uh, consequences in terms of safety. So he can vote. He can work long term because he owns all the shares. It's a privately held corporation. Irving is in the same position with all its railroad assets. I don't know any of the details of New Brunswick Southern or the two railways that it owns in in Maine, but it does have that advantage of not being subject to the day to day stock market pressures. But, uh, um, the assets of uh, of MMA because uh, it was it was just an empty shell at this point and started to operate the railway again. I think in in the beginning of 2014, um, and uh, and it you know it it continued until just about a year or so ago and then it then it sold it to a I believe it was a Japanese conglomerate. Uh, um, so I'm I am not sure exactly how it operates, but it's really far from uh, mm -hmm. the location of of the activity. It's it's done really well economically. I've seen reports from Forbes and Wall Street Journal. It's it's doing well, and obviously it was able to sell uh, at, at a good price. Uh, it's not carrying unit trains uh, through Lac Megantic uh, anymore. There's no um, they have a moratorium that hasn't been. I don't think it will. Uh, resume until they've now got a commitment. The federal and provincial governments have got a commitment to to build a bypass around around the town. It's possible when the bypass is uh, is is completed in 2022, or if they're still ha hauling a lot of this stuff. By <coughs> rail. But they're hauling a lot of dangerous goods through the town by rail. So, yep. and and those dangers are still there. And to, to you know, for a town that's uh, you know, that's th those kind of post-traumatic psychological trauma is affecting uh, uh, a majority of the population. Um, uh, you can imagine what it's like. And I've been in the town when, uh, you know, you're kind of jolted out of bed at five o'clock in the morning with the screeching uh, of a of a, a a train whistles, you know. So it's a, it's a reminder day in and day out. Just like it's a reminder when this, uh, you know, the settlement with the, the plea deal with New Brunswick Southern, it gets back and gets back in the news and it's reminding them, it's reminding them that after all these years, um, you know, no one has been held accountable. The uh, Globe and Mail, maybe a year ago, did a center spread feature on the um, post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. consequence for the people in the community. Um, it was an excellent piece. It was a human piece as opposed to the business or mm -hmm. finance piece. Mm -hmm. And to try to keep people aware of how that town continues to cope. Mm -hmm. In doing your book, you've mm -hmm. met many people. Yes. Can you give us a human face and some stories? I can. I can. I mean, I, uh, I, mean, I started off being quite removed from, from, you know, as a policy analyst. There was a certain detachment. Um, and I was on holidays, and I thought, oh, I'll write a report. Uh, 
get it out as soon as possible. I think I called it where the buck stops because of my concern. Um, and um, when I got back from holidays, uh, I learned that m one of my colleagues had lost three members of her extended family. Uh, uh, so the two little girls, the four and nine year old girl and their mother. Uh, so that put a whole new dimension. Uh, still wanted to make sure I was rigorous in my analysis, but you know, there was this, this human, uh, this human aspect to the story. I met the grandparents, uh, and you know, I, I know, you know, I have a sense of what, what, you know, they've gone through. I wrote a couple of reports, and as I continued to write, I think people in the town, or certainly the activists and the people who were really uh, um, the watchdogs, uh, realized what I, you know, what I was doing, and who is this guy? Uh, an Anglo from an outside. An Anglo from, yeah. <laughs> And uh, and so when I was at the law faculty, because um, some of my reports actually were were translated or long summaries were translated, and so I mean, like Megantic is a, is a very, as you know, very unilingual yeah. um, uh, town. So they invited me down, uh, and they invited me down at the time. I guess the first time was uh, when the transport committee was there, and uh, so we got to know each other. Um, um, they asked me advice. I obliged. And so that was kind of the beginning uh, of, a, of a relationship. And then I organized, a because um, uh, I was at the University of Ottawa, I organized a conference at the end of October uh, at the law faculty. And um, probably six or seven people from the town came. We had a um, a whole morning session on perspectives from Lac Megantic. Uh, so that was, you know, that, and that was really good for, you know, the, the audience that, uh, 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 th that was able to get a sense of what was happening after. So this was 2016, a few years after. Uh, and I've since, I've since uh, maintained that. Uh, and I, um, you know, one of the, one of the people in that group um, was was a survivor in the sense that he, he was crossing the track, had just crossing the track, and he saw this train uh, uh, just hurtling towards him, and he just dove and, to get out of its way. And this was just before the curve, uh, and the heat from from that train. It was going at 105 kilometers an hour at this point. This driverless train, um, and the, the heat from the from the uh, from the train, drove the fibers of the of his shirt deep into his skin. It was that intense, and he's had, you know, major problems with his with his, uh, you know, with his uh, skin ever since. I mean, he's also had, you can imagine, the psychological trauma of he knew everybody in that uh, nightclub, the music cafe, and he had just just left his friends. Uh, so you can imagine that trauma. Um, and other witnesses uh, that I talked to, uh, and some I I used from from media reports. But I did I did talk a lot of people uh, firsthand and got their experiences of survival. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have a whole chapter on on that night and the days after. Although it's not a chapter when I'm doing talks, I don't usually get into the the details of the stories because it's actually too hard for me to do it to just emotionally yeah. uh, but we know the magnitude of, of of the crisis we know of the derailment and the explosions the size of the explosions the people that died the 47 people that died and then shortly after two people committed suicide and they're included in and I talk about the 49 people yes this is one of the firefighters that uh, that pulled his ex-girlfriend out of out of the out of the flames, out of the 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 ruins, um, and and so you know, so so I there there is that story uh, of that night that's in that's in the book, and they the people in in Lac Megantic have helped me to tell that story, and I you know when I've done I've done talks all over Canada and the United States since the book came out. And I always start my talks by saying, I'm here, I'm greetings from my friends in Nakmagantic. I'm not speaking for, you know, officially. Uh, this is for, for my f friends in there. They trust me to tell uh, their story. And this the story of what happened uh, 
and but also what happened subsequently. And they talk about cascading tragedies in the town. Uh, and there, the, the stories of the ambulance chasers that came up from from Texas, the story of the disaster capitalists that convinced uh, municipal officials to kind of wipe, wipe the slate clean, sort of creative destruction. They tore down more buildings on the, on the very shaky ground that they were also contaminated. Uh, I tell a story of, uh, of Geneviève Boulanger, who, um, whose house was burned in the fire and and they wanted to expropriate her land, and they said, you know, we can't guarantee, and you could be in real trouble if you try to sell or even try to rebuild, and you won't get insurance, and blah, blah, blah. And so they fought, they fought and fought, and they were the only ones that were able to reclaim their land. And and because of the, the studies that had been done right after or months after said there was no contamination on her land. So they rebuilt their house. Uh, uh, right by the lake, so there's 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 great stories of uh, uh, you know I talk about the the the, the sense the, the the trauma and the wanting to just forget everything and and move on and just inability to to deal with with it and then those who you know who refused to be crushed beneath the wheels and continued to um, to monitor. Uh, the tracks and to continue to go out on the tracks and look at the rails and bring experts on the tracks, even though they were threatened by the company that they were on private property, and have you know and and confronting the transport minister about this company not responding to them and having this and that safety gap, pushing for uh, pushing for um, the bypass and now and other things, but now their big their big push is. Um, is for a judicial inquiry because because the only public trial uh, was the criminal trial. All everything else was was uh, was held behind closed doors. They were all done as plea agreements, uh, including the civil suits. Uh, and so they've got a petition with the help of a member of parliament. It's a parliamentary petition. You know, people can go online and, and get, gain access to it. And uh, as long as they get their name in on the petition before May 15th, it'll, it'll, it'll go in. So that, that, that's just one of the things. But, but they also, and I, I probably should, should say this because uh, um, uh, they are aware of uh, the recent uh, plea bargain in the case of NB Southern. Uh, and for them, uh, both the fact that NB Southern, uh, it, was, it, it was charged with 24 counts of violation of the Transportation of Dangerous Goods Act, and it, 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 uh, it, uh, its plea agreement, it, was, it got off on, on all but two, so it, was, it pled guilty to two, and then there was a small fine, $10,000 and a $40,000 contribution. You know, I haven't seen the court documents and the rationale, but my my sense is that if you can imagine six years after and everything that they've gone through and no one has been held accountable, no one as in, and the owners, the executive of any kind of criminal negligence or any, you know, CP, CP refuses to settle. Irving, to its credit, settled in the civil cases and contributed $75 million to that settlement. But CP is still in court, still pushing back, still delaying. There may be, there may be more court procedures uh, this spring, I don't know, but it's, it's kind of the, the lone holdout. But if, if you can imagine the sense of injustice from people who have been waiting for answers and waiting for some sort of accountability. No one, I mean, often in a situation like this, um, you know, it's the people at the head of, you know, the political, uh, the policymakers that take accountability. And in fact, um, one of the things that I document is how, how the guidelines, the Privy Council guidelines for ministers were in their accountability went from, you know, you're basically accountable for everybody and everything that happens. And, uh, you know, it, it changed that accountability in 2011. So it would have been 
under Harper to, to, to basically say, well, you know, no, you're not. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, the, 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 the minister was a guy named Denis Lebel. Within a week, he was out. And so he didn't have to defend anything in public. He didn't have to take on journalist questions. Uh, and it was Lisa Raitt. Now, Lisa Raitt wasn't francophone, couldn't speak French very well, but she was pretty sharp at managing a crisis like that as a communicator. Uh, LaBelle just made a mess of it when he went to him. And the two, the two ones that made the biggest mess were LaBelle and, and Burkhardt. They, they were pretty boneheaded when they came to the community. And instead of kind of, you know, expressing an empathy with what had happened, uh, they did, they, they continued to blame, especially, well, especially Burkhardt, but LaBelle was talking about, oh yes, those dot one eleven cars were safe, and oh yes, we put more and more money into safety, and he was being very defensive instead of what he should have been doing, was empathizing, and I think that was part of the reason that, that he was shifted out within about a week of, of mm. it happening. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, it's important for people to remember the human side, not just the financial mm -hmm. side. And to keep trying to draw those two narratives closer together. Yeah. As you were describing all of that, I kept wondering if, back to that connection between the shareholders. Mm -hmm. it's like, mm -hmm. Somewhere near the shareholders, if they organized a few bus loads, <laughs> yeah. go to Lac Megantic and see this is where you made your money. Yeah, yeah. This is where you got your quarterly dividend. Yeah. And, and to close that loop, Somehow, some way, and maybe yeah. there's some healing to be had because yeah. on a bigger scale, the yeah. issue of making profit off yeah. disaster yeah. or profit and it creates disaster, yeah. that value set at yeah. some point needs a shift. And then to turn that to New Brunswick, um, we don't have a place in our province to tell many of our stories. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's either three minutes here, 30 seconds there. Um, mm -hmm. The control centers are in Toronto and Halifax, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here's a whole province with this very large oil refinery yeah. down on the East Coast. Yeah. And we have no oil in New Brunswick. <laughs> yeah. You just so refine it. <laughs> where's all that oil coming from? Yeah. So it's all passing through here, whether it's yeah. by ship or by rail, basically. Yeah. And the yeah. pipeline discussion will take its turns and, yeah. and wiggle around. But the uh, so tied to all of that, people are just not aware how much oil comes through this province by rail. Yeah. And Lac Megantic isn't that far away. Yeah. There were two oil derailments um, shortly after the Lac Megantic one in northern New Brunswick. There was Plaster Rock? Was yeah, that one Plaster Rock yeah. was one. I'm blanking on the other one yeah. right now, but I can see the images. Yeah. I'm thinking, yeah, and we're not a big media center. Yeah. So And 40-some-odd and some -odd people in a whole downtown wasn't destroyed. Mm -hmm. So there was no spin, no yeah. buzz, no attention to it. Yeah. And it's the same issue. Yeah. Longer trains... Yeah. More weight, um, more speeding track, but no track maintenance. Yeah, yeah. And, and no inspection, and and that's stunning or, or and, inadequate inspection. Yeah, so heaven forbid you forecast the disaster, but you yeah. can pay attention to all of the elements yeah. that are still in play. That's right. Drawing to that oil refinery, and then the lack of uh, transparency or yep. even access to information. That's right. And New Brunswick right. sits right in that space now. Yeah, and you know one of the. You know, there was a kind of a flurry of activity on the part of the regulator on both sides of the borders after it happened. You know, you have public confidence that's expecting to be protected, and then it's, and then it's shattered. And so a lot kind of was done to demonstrate that they were, you know, had things in hand, and it was, um, you know, safer, and they'd taken all these measures, and there were some measures taken. But my point is that there are enduring safety gaps, and I've seen them manifested in in accidents since, and that the, the window is still open for um, history to repeat itself. Uh, and so whether it's, you know, just appalling fatigue management practices um, uh, on the part of the companies and their unwillingness, even though, you know, the government pushes them, but they've been resisting proper fatigue management practices for, for years before. Uh, um, and, you know, Tom Harding, the locomotive engineer on MMA, he was working on his day off. He was up for almost 18 hours. It was a factor in diagnosing the problem with the with the smoking and uh, defective locomotive uh, in discussing it. And, I mean, one of the things... Uh, 
One of the things that I, I do is show how the deck was stacked against the locomotive engineer. That's a, it's an important part of my, my book. But getting back to the shareholder question, which, which you asked, uh, um, in the, the lack, see, it used to belong to CP in the mid-90s when they got carte blanche, both the Class 1 railways got carte, carte blanche to sell off what they thought were unprofitable rail lines uh, that was that was one of them and you know in uh, we know that railways are and were the backbone of this country and essential to to the founding of this country and and in return they had an obligation in the country they got a lot of land and they got mineral rights and they got all of, they got subsidies and and so in the mid 90s they could just rip up on profitable land sell to what became short line railways one of which was uh, Montreal Maine and Atlantic uh, in the case of Montreal Maine and Atlantic um, I mean, it was a, it was privately held, but because, um, like many communities, uh, it's dependent on the railway, forest products industry, uh, agriculture, uh, granite in the case of Lac Megantic, and so one of the you know it was essentially Ed Burkhart's holding company that controlled it, had seventy five percent of the shares, but issued. Um, about 13% of the shares to the Quebec Pension Fund. The Quebec Front Pension Fund wanted to make sure that there was going to be an option for the people in Lac Megantic. Burkhart had leverage. Uh, and so he came in and then just disrupted uh, the whole system. But by this time, they were pretty, pretty implicated. So, uh, and it's the same with, with CP. I mean, you had a number of pension funds that you know, when Harrison came and Ackman came, and Ackman only had 15% of the shares, but there were pension funds that, you know, they didn't know much about railways, but they knew of what benefited their pension fund. Uh, and so they went, they went in and they signed on to, the, to, the, to what Ackman was, was pushing. Um, and whether, you know, the shareholders... Uh, I mean, I think to the extent that shareholders are informed about this, there's probably their, their corporate documents that lay out what the legal uh, proceedings have been and where it, it's likely to go and what the chances are of, of there being a fine or there being a penalty of some sort. Shareholders read this and move on. I mean, there's no kind of... There's no connection with with uh, the role that CP played uh, in in the tragedy. I mean, they just you know, as CP says, we handed it off to MMA. End of story. Wasn't our problem. You know, we didn't do anything wrong. They did. <laughs> but they 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 were the contractor, and they chose MMA as the subcontractor. And. How that decision is made is something might, we might learn more of in an open court proceeding. But if you compare, if they had partnered with CN and gone up the south shore of this, the St. Lawrence River and then down through New Brunswick, the CN route was longer, a lot safer than MMA, um, but uh, the CN would have had a greater share of the, of the profits from that, whereas MMA... Uh, was a shorter route, and then there were t three Irving railways transporting it the rest of the way, um, and how that you know how that decision came about, um, and you know the the CP is uh, uh, you know as it, it, it has an obligation to choose the safest route. It obviously didn't choose the safest route, uh, and how, how were they compelled or not compelled by the regulator to choose the safest route? Um, is a question that remains to be uh, answered. Great. We have about two or three minutes left. Okay. How would you like to wrap up? Um, maybe specific to what New Brunswick needs to be aware of or keep their eyes open for or suggestions. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, I think, uh, you know, I've learned uh, since I've been here about uh, what's, I have some sense of what's going through. One of the, one of the things that I remember being uh focused on uh, a couple of years ago was what was happening in Belle Dune. Uh, and uh, there was a, a Chaleur Terminals, which was, uh, I guess, an Alberta-owned company, was wanting to bring diluted bitumen uh, 
uh, to Baldoon, and that's it's a, uh, an ocean-going port, and then it's just then export it from there. And so uh, you you probably know the story that it it uh, it got approval from the environmental department uh, in New Brunswick. There was a challenge by the Mi'kmaq. That challenge was unsuccessful. Uh, the people uh, along the route in Quebec, like the town of Rimouski, or I think it was Riviere de Loup, uh, asked for a federal environmental assessment. The transport minister nicks that. This is federally regulated. Uh, that's not the job. Uh, it's the New Brunswick, and it's just passing through. So that was, uh, so then in 15 and 16, there was a real drop in, in traffic for a variety of reasons, but it picked up uh, in in 2017. I actually, uh, transport by rail is at record levels now in, in Canada. Most of it's going south of the border. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so, uh, uh, so it, where is this pro uh, where is this project? I you know the latest I saw was they were thinking now that Quebec or Energy East is uh, is dead, and I don't know if that's the case or whether it'll be brought back from the dead. But at the time they were thinking, okay, let's let's uh, make sure we move forward with this Beldoon term terminal, which would uh, transport an additional one hundred and sixty thousand barrels per day of d diluted bitumen through Quebec, down through the M Mattapiti, into Campbellton, then down to Beldoon. So I think that's something to, to watch for, although I haven't heard anything. And then, you know, where is, uh, where is uh, uh, Irving getting its oil fr from? I don't, I think most of it, if it's coming by rail, it's coming through the U.S. Uh, and it, there's probably a lot coming by ship. Uh, the big the big oil boom now is in the Permian Basin, in West Texas. It's enormous. It's fracked oil again. Uh, it's uh, it, just in the Permian Basin now. It's increased to the point where they they're producing in that one area as much oil as they're producing in all of Canada, uh, and it's increased uh, exponentially to get to that point. And the U.S. is now the largest uh, largest producer uh, of oil in the world. It's surpassed uh, Saudi Arabia and. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so I think I think that that's one to really kind of um, um, understand um, where the oil is coming from, what the volumes are. I know that that uh, um, that Irving has the capacity to process a little bit of diluted bitumen, but mainly it's it's uh, you know either standard crude or frac crude because that's light crude and they can. Uh, you know they can. It, it's easy, easily refinable. So you know what's going, where it's going through, and and what are the risks? Uh, who's wa who's watching the watchers, and uh, who's on? Uh, you know who's checking out the the tracks? Who's how many inspectors are are inspecting mm. uh, 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 the railway from Transport Canada? Does the uh, I know in the U.S. they have a lot of state inspectors that are doing additional inspections inspection of the of of rail safety i don't know if it's possible uh in um in new brunswick i don't i don't even know if other provinces are doing that they just pretty much leave it to the federal government all of those uh, and i think you know as i said regulatory capture <coughs> is an essential theme where you have this powerful uh, industry that and and a and a weak uh, un, uh, under resourced and dysfunctional regulator that is that is uh, com compliant uh, uh, with uh, with the whims of of the industry and doesn't have any independent capacity to evaluate and doesn't have the tension and there should always be the tension because the the role of the regulator is first and foremost to protect the safety. Uh, uh, of the public, and that's not the role of the companies. First and foremost, it's the, it's shareholders, it's the owners, it's profits, and so they 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 should never be seen as as a, 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 as one, but rather uh, as rather retention. And you know, both of them at a certain level have imp you know that that obligation and goal to make sure the rails safe. But when you're when you have the capacity as an industry to support uh, subordinate safety. To profits, then you you're you're in danger, and that danger still exists, in my view. Thank you. You're welcome. It's nice to be with you. And thank you for watching. If you like the work we do, please go to thedentistreport.ca and click PayPal or Patreon.
Be good. Have fun. Love each other.